published in 2010, Beyond Katrina, a meditation on the Mississippi Gulf Coast is poet Natasha Trethway's intimate profile of the Gulf Coast, and the individuals whose lives were forever altered by Hurricane Katrina, which struck the area in 2005. Trethway grew up in Gulfport, where much of her family still lives. Interweaving her personal memories with experiences of those in the region, Trethway delineates the gradual erosion of the local culture as well as its rising dependence on tourism. The author also chronicles years of wetland development that has worsened destruction in the region. Most movingly, she illustrates the devastation caused by Hurricane Katrina through the story of her brother and his efforts to recover what he lost. The first section of the book is devoted to detailing the destruction left by Hurricane Katrina. Residents of the coast refer to events as BK or AK that is, before Katrina or after Katrina. The most destructive hurricane BK was Camille, which struck the region in 1969. It destroyed buildings and washed boats ashore, although its rage does not compare with that of Katrina. Trethway speaks of her aging grandmother who struggles with dementia and whose memory has conflated these two events. Trethway takes a moment to note that people in the region tend to compare Mississippi to Louisiana stating that things like levees and local government were successful after the storm in Mississippi, whereas they failed in Louisiana. In Mississippi, volunteer efforts were very effective. In Louisiana, ineffective and corrupt decision-making led to the deaths of many poor people. However, the author challenges this oversimplification, indicating that stories surrounding Katrina are often untrue or only partially accurate. Trethway points out that the businesses that were the first to reopen on the Mississippi coast were the so-called boats, floating casinos created by the 1992 legislation that legalized gambling in the state but restricts it to navigable water. Their deep pockets allowed the casinos to fund their own rebuilding. Due to their massive contributions to the state's tax coffers, the casinos received rebuilding permits quite easily, according to Trethway. The casinos provided people with jobs in one of the most economically depressed areas in the country. This was embraced due to a fear of the loss of the cultural heritage of the coast and the depletion of the wetlands. Thus, quaint towns were turned into neon-lit gambling resorts. Trethway interweaves her family history with the broader history of the Mississippi coast. Son Dixon, her great-uncle, was born near the turn of the 20th century. His parents, former Delta sharecroppers, moved to the coast, and he gradually established himself as a businessman within the black community in Gulfport. Sun possessed several rental houses, and he was considered a good landlord among individuals who often struggled with housing. After World War II, the shipbuilding trade started to become a central part of the coast's economy. Using his veteran benefits, Sun constructed nightclubs that catered to shipbuilders. In tandem with Sun's story, Trethway describes Gulfport's growth as one of the country's shipbuilding centers, and the Mississippi coastline's transformation from marshy wetland to the country's longest man-made beach at 26 continuous miles. Trethway also takes a moment to note some small stories related to the destruction of Katrina and its aftermath, revealing that larger economic interests have wielded the disaster to push small businesses out of the community. Cicero Timms, a friend of Trethway's late great-uncle, owns a snow cone stand in the Gulfport area where Trethway's family has lived for years. He asserts that permits for renovations and repairs on structures were hard to come by, and often city officials would outright refuse to provide permits for complete rebuilds, though the rationale for doing so was never given. Trethway the zooms out to expose some of the disparities in the way federal rebuilding money was distributed and how. Restrictions were ignored in some places and enforced in others. Rather than replacing all of the low-income housing that was lost in the storm, says Trethway, Mississippi found a means of diverting those funds to the expansion and refurbishment of the Gulfport port. This project was in the planning phase long before Katrina struck. Joe, Trethway's brother, inherited the majority of properties owned by Son Dixon. Prior to the storm, Joe was filling his great-uncle's shoes as a landlord and using his building skills to expand into a small contracting business. However, Joe found himself unable to find steady work and could not pay his taxes or mortgage on his uninsured properties. As a result, in desperation, Joe decided to transport several ounces of cocaine, which yielded him $4,000. He eventually was caught and received a felony conviction. Trethway is convinced none of this would have occurred if Katrina had not destroyed the coast, had rebuilding funds been managed fairly. 
and had city governments not put undue burdens on small and largely minority-owned businesses. The author notes seeing a politician's billboard that states, Katrina isn't over. She contends that the coast's future is ever-evolving, the storm's ramifications still very much alive in the minds of those whose lives are forever changed. I hope you enjoyed this video leave a like if you did and be sure to subscribe thank you.